Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter 5 is a very famous passage, and what we're going to be focusing on this evening is what's known as the Beatitudes. So if you don't know what that word means, it's just the, the fancy theological name for what we read in the first basically you know, 11, 12 verses in Matthew chapter 5 which is the, the blessed are the poor, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the meek. So you see that whole list of who's blessed. Beatitudes just means it's the blessings, right? That's just another way of saying it's, it's all these various blessings. So it's a very famous passage, and we're going to actually take some time and dig into this tonight, and we're going to go through each one of the statements that Jesus makes about who is blessed and hopefully be able to just flesh it out just a little bit to get a good understanding of what he means by each of the phrases. Sometimes you might have read through this and be like, what exactly does it mean when he says, you know, the poor in spirit or whatever? And we're going to look at other references where these words have been used to, to help us to get a full understanding and meaning about what the Bible is teaching us here. And at the end of the day, one of the main themes that you're going to get from this is ultimately you're going to reap what you sow and if you not just if you reap what you sow but also when you go through hard times here when you're doing what's right there is a goal there there is a relief there is a reward for for going through the hardship here think about the story in luke chapter 16 of lazarus and the rich man and what we see in that parable or that story is basically the same truth that we're going over here. In that story, you had a, a, a poor man named Lazarus who was full of sores. He was begging for food. He was just eating the scraps off of the rich man's table. And the dogs were licking his wounds. And, and he was living a very difficult life, a very sad life, a very hard life on this earth. But the rich man, you know, he, it says he fared sumptuously, which means he ate a lot of really good food. He had, he had everything handed to him. He had no worries other than just this beggar that would come to him and, and ask him for scraps. And then when the two die, of course, the rich man ends up going to hell, but that poor man was saved. And yeah, he went through and dealt with a lot in this life, but he ended up going to heaven. He ended up having the rest of eternity living a much, much, much better life and the rich man being, you know, obviously being tormented and torment, uh, tortured in hell, which is a, a very, very horrible existence and etern eternal home. And that same, a similar concept is being taught here. So let's dig into this. Let's go back to verse number one in Matthew 5. Bible says, in seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain and when he was set, his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. So he's opening his mouth. He's teaching his disciples directly right here. He gets himself set up, sits down, and then he starts, he starts off his sermon. Because this whole passage that we read here is all Jesus Christ speaking. And it doesn't stop where Matthew 5 stops. He keeps going and going and teaching a lot more. So this is like he's, he's just um, the intro or the beginning of, of his teaching. And there's so much... I mean, every single verse, every single sentence that Jesus is, is making here is just so packed full of, of goodness and truth and doctrine. Um, how amazing it would have been just to, just to hear him, like audibly, just to be a, a disciple and just, just sit under his preaching and teaching. Must be amazing. I can't wait, right? The good thing is we don't have to wor wonder too much about what it was like back then because he's coming back. And he's going to set up a, a kingdom here on earth and we're going to be able to hear him. We're going to be under his authority and under his rule and be able to hear everything that he says audibly, visibly, seeing the Son of God ruling and reigning on this earth. What, what a day that'll be. All right, verse number three. Let's dig into this. Verse number three says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you want to keep a bookmarker here, we'll go back here. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 66. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, we know what it means to be poor, right? Just, just your wealth, how much finances you have, to, to not really have much. And when you're poor, poor is often associated with the word lowly, right? You don't have a lot, you're low, you're kind of abased, you're brought down 
being poor. And that's basically what the Bible is meaning here. Say, hey, if you're, if you're poor in spirit, if you're lowly, you're going to be blessed. And this is, this is actually, this concept is mentioned in, in multiple ways in the Beatitudes here. Um, I want to say there, there's definitely some differences in the way that it's worded, but more like nuanced differences, right? But the same theme of, of basically being humble and meek and lowly. So it's using the, the, the phrase being poor in spirit, that if you're poor in spirit, you're going to be blessed. And another, uh, uh, probably a better way to help us understand this is in Isaiah 66, verse number one. The Bible says, thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? If you remember it, it, other, uh, another place in Matthew chapter 5, it's talking about God and the, the heaven being his throne and the earth being his footstool. It's interesting how that ties in with this chapter with what Jesus is teaching on. Because look at verse number 2. It says, For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. This gives us a very good contrast between who God is and who we are and who God's looking to exalt and who God is going to bless. He's going to bless the person who recognizes that God is the one that's all powerful. God is the one who made everything. God is the one who sits in heaven and this whole earth is just like his footstool. I mean, this is, this is so, so small to God because God is so great and magnificent. And see, human beings have a tendency to, to get themselves lifted up in themselves and lifted up in pride and so full of themselves and feel so high and mighty and powerful and just forsake God and say, who is the Lord? Who is God? When in reality, that puffed up man is nothing, nothing compared to God. But to have such a pompous attitude, God doesn't like that. He says, I'm going to look for the person who's putting themselves in the proper place when he recognizes who I am and they come to me with a poor or a contrite or a broken spirit, right? Someone who's, who's humble and lowly and is not going to think too highly of themselves but come to the Lord as a sinner, as broken, as poor, as lowly and, and understanding their place with God. And that's who God is looking for, and that's who God's going to bless. And see, a lot of, of our life and our existence here, in a way, it's like a test. Because what we do here matters in the afterlife. Everything that we do here matters in eternity. The short time that we have to spend on this earth You've got just enough time to hear the gospel and get saved. And then from that point forward, you know, up until the day you die, that's your opportunity to earn rewards, to receive those blessings of God or to, to rack them up. And that's it. Because then it's eternity from there on out. We don't see anywhere in Scripture any other opportunities to accumulate more. In, in, in God's system, right? Like, like outside of, uh, you know, when he sets up his kingdom and then new heaven, new earth, there's nothing given to us there saying that there's a, a way to kind of gain more rewards, more benefits being in heaven. So like, it's, it's all boils down to what we do here. It makes our existence here extremely important. And we want to keep ourselves in the right mindset with God. He says here, hey, blessed are the poor in spirit. And, you know, similarly, what I was mentioning this morning, it's not going to be all these things that happen, like the next one is blessed are they that mourn. They're not pleasurable experiences, right? 
Being poor isn't pleasant. Now, we ought to be content. We ought to be happy with what God's given us. I mean, I'm talking about just physically poor. It's harder to get through life being physically poor, to not having as much as many means. It's harder. It makes things more difficult. But don't get the, the false idea and get distracted by that just because things may seem a little bit more difficult to say, well, well money is the answer. Because it's not. And what Jesus is doing here is helping us to stay on track. So say, okay, you're poor in spirit. You're humble. You're low. You might feel like other people are just walking all over you. And, well, I don't want to be walked over anymore, so I'm going to be like them. Wrong. Don't do that. Just like, just like I was talking about earlier today with the first sermon, you know, if someone starts attacking you and reviling you, you're going to want to feel like you want to attack back. But that's not the right response. The same way, you know, we ought to, just because other people may be lifted up and appear to be very successful and because they're real proud and they've got everything together, that, that's not the way that we should be. And Jesus is telling us, you know what? You're blessed if you're poor in spirit. You're blessed when you mourn. God sees what's going on in your life. And God understands. And see, God is the ultimate judge that rights every wrong. So when he sees somebody doing right and living right and doing what they're told to do by their maker, he, we can just trust that he will make things right. You don't have to take it in your own hands. He will do it. And, he, and he's giving us that affirmation in these few verses. You're blessed. Be poor in spirit. Be lowly. Be humble because you'll be blessed. Blessed are they that mourn. Why? For they shall be comforted. Turn, if you would, to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. There is a place for mourning, and it's not always a bad thing. See, these days, we live in a world that tells you, oh, you're mourning, you're sad, you're depressed. Here's some drugs so you don't have to feel that way. Here's some drugs to just, just make you feel better. Because you shouldn't, you shouldn't be upset, you shouldn't be sad, you shouldn't be mourning. And just want to give you some pills to make it all go away. Jesus said, blessed are they that mourn. Even those that have a lot to mourn, that have a lot of problems in their life, that have a lot of, of tragedies, comfort will come. God will not leave you comfortless. If you're saved, right, Jesus has sent the comforter already. We've got the Holy Ghost for one. But when we get through the trials and tribulations of this life, we could enter into the rest of the Lord and, and have eternity to spend being comforted, being in the light, the direct light coming from God. But we need to make it through this time here. We need to, to not, and I'm not saying you need to do that to be saved, but, you know, get through this portion and have that confidence because there is a rest, there is comfort that's coming and Jesus and God sees when you mourn, you'll receive comfort. Ecclesiastes 7, verse number 2, the Bible reads, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. There's a value to being sad, to grieving, mourning, and comforting others as well, instead of just turning everything into a big joke and fun and feasting and happy, whatever. The Bible says your heart becomes better. You become strengthened. You understand more. You're going to be more compassionate. You're going to be a better person when you go through these hard times. It actually benefits you, believe it or not. You say, I don't like feeling sad. Well, I don't know anyone who really enjoys being sad or grieving or mourning, 
But when you get through it, it makes you better. It makes your heart better. The Bible says in verse number four, the heart of the wise, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. But the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Mirth just means, you know, happiness, pleasure, whatever, right? The house of mirth where everything's just a big joke, a big game, fun, all the time, whatever feels good, that's what I'm going to be focused on. That's the house of fools. But the heart of the wise is going to be in the house of mourning. And the more you understand, the more knowledge you have, the more sorrow you have. The, Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was very wise. He was very understanding. And there's a lot of things that can grieve your heart that you see happening in this world. I mean, it's, it's, it's a grief of heart to see how many fools there are that don't pay attention to what's really important, that are going to go through this life, waste an entire life, and end up burning in hell. Because they didn't want to hear this or because, oh, it's a downer, man. I don't want to hear about that. I don't want to hear about hell. Why bring me down? I just want to have fun. And Look, it's reality. You need to face it. And it's okay to face it. And Jesus said, you know what? If you mourn, don't worry. You'll be blessed because you'll be comforted. Bible says in verse number five, it is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. Turn if you would to Isaiah 61. Actually, you know what? Turn if you would to Psalm 37. I'll, I'll just read Isaiah 61 for you. Turn to Psalm 37. Isaiah 61.1 reads, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning the garment of praise for, that, for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. The context, again, in verse number one of that, of that chapter was, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to do these things, to proclaim the acceptable year, to comfort the mourn. And that's, that's the fulfilling of Jesus' promise. Hey, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we see in Isaiah 61, the Spirit of God providing the comfort to those that mourn and actually going and, and providing the oil of joy for mourning. Uh, another thing that's interesting about that verse there is it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. And we're talking about the, the lowly in spirit, the poor in spirit. So the, the gospel is being preached unto the meek, specifically being sent unto the meek why? Because the proud won't receive it. The proud in heart will not receive the gospel. Plain and simple. You have to humble yourself in order to receive the gospel. You have to. You cannot, no, no proud person is going to accept because why? Because they're trusting in themselves. They're too lifted up in themselves to ever bring themselves low enough to realize they need to rely on somebody else. You have to have a humble spirit in order to be saved. You have to. And unfortunately, some people need to be brought down against their own will. But thank God that that does happen. It's way better to be brought down to nothing in this earth and to have your soul be saved than it is to live this life full of riches and pride and die and go to hell forever. I had to turn to Psalm 37. Matthew 5, 5, where we read... Continuing with the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And this, of course, ties in perfectly with the poor in spirit, saying theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, they shall, um, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. When, uh, when Jesus comes back, he's saying the meek, they're going to inherit the earth. The meek, 
is an attribute of people who get saved. Verse number one, Psalm 37. Let's look at verse number one. The Bible reads, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. So up to this point, we're going to read a little bit more, but up to this point we see He's starting off saying, fret not thyself because of evildoers. Don't be envious that these people are doing wickedly. Don't worry about them. Don't get upset with them. You don't have to get all angry with them. Their end is going to come, is what he's going to explain here. He says, you just need to delight yourself in the Lord, commit your way unto God, and do what's right. Don't worry about these other people who are doing wickedness and them not getting what's coming to them. Don't fret yourself over them. We don't have to worry about what all these wicked people are doing about their, about their end and what's going to happen to them because they will have their end. Verse number eight, uh, cease, cease from anger, forsake wrath, for not himself in any wise, for evildoers shall be cut off. It's God giving his promise. They will be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth for yet a little while and the wicked shall not be, yea, Thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just, and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. What we see in this life is temporary with the wicked, you know, being lofty and having all these riches and having all this wealth and having all the stuff and the people who are just full of themselves and full of pride. That is what we see temporarily. But what God's teaching us is it's just temporary. Don't worry, because just because the world is upside down right now with the way things operate, God's going to fix it all. And you who are meek right now, you who are lowly right now, you who are suffering and enduring and going through these times, you're going to be the one with the mansion. You're going to be the one with everything and not just temporarily, it's going to be forever. He's going to set things right. He's going to put everything the way it is. So all of your hard work, all of your efforts, all that you're doing to try to live for God and do what's right day after day, you're going to the grind of saying, no, I'm not going to make a bad choice. I'm going to try to do my best to live right and make it the hard way. It will pay off. But keep meek. Keep humble. And God will, he promises, to flip things back the right way so that you don't have to be discouraged in this lifetime when you see things that are backwards happening. Why is it that that person should have everything so easy? Why is it that this person is so lifted up and exalted and so many people love this person? They're wicked. And that's the way things are now, but it's not the way things will be. And God, God will write it, and we don't need to worry about it. They're going to have their end. And when, when the, the, the time comes for judgment, all will be set right. Next, be added to her, if you would, to, um, to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. The next verse in Matthew 5 is verse number 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. I don't have a corresponding verse to, to turn to this because it's, I think this is very easy to understand what we're talking about here. And this is just talking about people who want to do right. You hunger, you thirst, you set righteousness as, as being your goal, right? 
I'm, I'm striving for this. I'm, I'm hungry to do right. I'm thirsty just to do right. I, I want to fulfill this desire, and the desire is righteousness. The Bible says when you're hungry and thirsting after that, you will be filled. It's not an unattainable goal. It will happen one day that you will reach this point. But you know what? You're blessed. Those of you that are seeking out righteousness and trying to do the, you know, live according to this world the hard way, God will bless you for that. And He will fill you. And you can reach that. He will fill you with the righteousness. You just keep seeking after and keep seeking after it. The next uh, beatitude, verse number seven, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now we have a lot of references to this in Scripture. I could go through too many. But um, in Psalm 18.25, the Bible says, with the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful, with an upright man thou wilt show thyself upright. And this boils down to the, to the common teaching that, you know, be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. The way that you choose to be towards other people is the way that God's going to deal with you. And, and saved or unsaved, that's ultimately what's going to happen. Just because you're a child of God doesn't mean that God won't punish you in this lifetime for, for not being the way you're supposed to be towards other people. For being the, the spoiled brat that receives a gift that it's not very thankful for and still just wants to do things his own way. I want to live my life. I don't want God telling me what to do, whatever. You're not going to be living a very uh, blessed life because the Bible says, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. That time where, that you find yourself needing mercy, well, however merciful you've been, God's going to exact that back onto you. Look at verse number 23 here in Matthew 18. We'll see a good example of this. One of the ways you extend mercy to people is by forgiving them. Someone does you wrong, when you offer forgiveness, that's mercy, right? Mercy is, is um, letting up. You ever play the game mercy, right? You squeeze one another's hands and the, and the goal is to try to get the other person to, to give up. So the way they do that is they have to say, you know, you squeeze their hands and then they have to say mercy for you to stop hurting them, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a very simple game. But it expresses what mercy is. That's exactly what it is. You're saying, mercy, oh, please stop. You know, stop doing that. It hurts too much. Okay, get, have mercy on me. Don't hurt me anymore. Well, you may find yourself in a position to offer mercy unto people. And the more mercy you show unto others, when you find yourself in the other situation, on the receiving end of of pain or affliction, God's going to see the way you've been living and say, okay, you've been very merciful to others. Now you'll receive mercy. And this is a way of, of you know, if you will, racking up mercy for yourself, right? You, want, <laughs> you ever find yourself in situations like, I just want to be prepared. Stop being merciful to people. Don't exact everything. You know, someone owes you some money or whatever. Don't be the stickler for, well, I gave you this. You know, this is every last little thing. Show some mercy on people, whatever, right? That's just one, one example. There's so many ways that you could just, you know, let things go. Someone does wrong by you. You, you lend something to someone, they break it. And they're, they're already struggling anyways because they had to borrow whatever they had to borrow from you. They didn't have enough money to buy their own. Would you be... You know, do you have the right to, to force them to buy you a new one? Yeah, you do. Right? It's your property. They borrowed it. They have to replace it, whatever. But show the mercy. I think that's the wise thing to do. Jesus said that you'd be blessed when you're merciful. But I'll tell you what, if you're, if you're not merciful, then just expect that when you find yourself in that situation and you're brought down a little bit lower and you don't have the means to, to help yourself and then you have to borrow something and, you, and it breaks on you, guess what? Don't expect them to be merciful to you either. 
Because even if they don't know how you acted, God has a way of working things out that way. Look at verse number 23 here in Matthew 18. The Bible says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. See, the Lord of the servant here, he had every right to sell him and sell his wife because the guy had a debt. He owed him money. So this is the way that he's going to receive that payment, saying, well, it's time to pay up. So he's going to exact what that guy owed. But then because he had compassion on this person, he decides, all right, you know what? I'm going to forgive that debt. And he extends mercy unto him so that the guy doesn't have to go and be sold into bondage and his wife and his children and, you know, and, and have that great hardship. So through compassion, he extends mercy on him. But then that same man, though, that received that forgiveness, that received the mercy himself, he doesn't extend that same type of compassion to anyone else. And, and he ends up suffering for it. Look at verse number 28. But the same servant went out and found out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down on his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desiredst me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother, their trespasses. And this lines up perfectly with what we see Jesus teaching in Matthew 5. Extend mercy. You'll, you, God will be merciful to you when he sees you extending mercy, when he sees you forgiving. But when, when God, who has already offered you forgiveness, when God has already extended so much mercy on you, you think about all the times that you've wronged God by sinning. Every single instance in your entire life when you've broken God's laws, you've broken His commandments, you've transgressed against the Lord. I mean, what did you do today that broke God's commandments? What thought? What thing? What, you know, what about yesterday? What about the day before? What about the day before? What about the day before? Every single time, yet God still shows mercy on you. And then you're going to turn around and exact every last thing from somebody else? That's wicked. Appreciate what God has given to you and try to be more God-like by extending mercy and compassion unto others. Jesus says you'll be blessed. These are all ways to be blessed. Blessed is the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. The next one is blessed are the pure in heart. The Bible says, for they shall see God. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 24. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. I think the, the pure in heart is very simple here. I think it's just talking about everyone who's saved. Being washed in the blood of Christ, being pure. We get that from, as I quoted there, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, where he says, Flee also youthful lusts, follow after, follow righteousness, faith, charity, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. 
And then we see in Psalm 24, look at verse number one, the Bible says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Who's going to go to heaven? Who's going to be with God? Verse number four. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. And notice it brings up a couple other things here, too, about you not being lifted up, right? The lowly, the poor in spirit, having a pure heart. The next one, verse number 9 in Matthew 5 is, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And um, the Bible says in James 3.18, And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So there's that phrase of being a peacemaker. And I think that being a peacemaker is being a soul winner because you're bringing peace to people who need to have peace with God. You're making peace with a person where they're at odds with God being a sinner that does not have a Savior. Romans 10, 15, very famous, of course, and how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. And bring glad tidings of good things. Be a peacemaker. The Bible says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Children of God, not just because you were born into God's family, I think, but oftentimes, you know, we're referred to as a child of your father. It's because you do the things of your father. Abraham, or uh, when Jesus was saying, you're not of your father Abraham, right? Because you don't do the things that Abraham did. He says, you're of your father the devil. Physically, they were born of Abraham, right? But he's saying, you're not Abraham's children. You're a child of your father, the devil. And I think what the Bible's saying here, you know, being peacemakers, then you'll be called the children of God. Children of your father, be why? Because you're doing things that are going to, you know, being a peacemaker is uh, what God wants us to be and you're, you're showing that you are a child of God. Almost done here. Matthew 5, verse number 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Turn if you would to 1 Peter chapter 2. Last place to have you turn is tonight. 1 Peter chapter number 2. We read this already at the first service, but it's the same concept in the Beatitude here in Matthew 5.10, being persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse number 19, for this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it? If when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. I don't know if I told you the verse. We're in verse number 21 right now, 1 Peter 2, 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously." This is, again, in regards to blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When you're doing right, and yet you're still persecuted, you're still um, being afflicted, the Bible says you're blessed. And he follows up that verse 10 with verse number 11. He says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. 
And this is, this is the last point, and I just want to stress this because the more that you hunger and thirst after righteousness, the more that you change your life from following the way of the world and start living a more separated life and you really, really start to care about the things of the Bible and make the changes, you're going to be viewed as different and weird and the persecution is going to come because you believe Scripture. Because you believe this. I, um, it's, it's funny because I'm starting to get a little... Uh, I've been away from work and in a sense the world for a while because I've been spending a lot of time at home. We've been doing move. I've been busy doing so much stuff, busy with church things, busy just doing a lot of different things. But now being back in an environment where I'm kind of regularly on a day-to-day -day basis getting into that, there's, su there's such a stark contrast in the way that the world lives, in the way that I live. Now, I haven't, I, honestly, I, like, I've only been working for a couple weeks at this place and, and no one's been giving me a hard time or persecuting or stuff, but I expect it to happen because I'm not going to back down on anything that I believe and it's going to sound weird. So when Halloween comes up and I've already got the email saying that all the new hires must dress up. I'm not dressing up. <laughs> I'm not celebrating the death holiday. I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm not sorry, I'm not. Okay? Now, I don't go trying to make a big deal out of this stuff. You do what you want to do, but you know what? Whether it's that, whether it's, you know, I've already turned down the, the invite to go out and have drinks after work. Already turning down, you know, there's, there's, that's the way of the world. You expect that, but when you make the decision to say, no, I'm actually going to try to do what's right and, and seek after righteousness and live a certain way, you're going to be different. And because you're different, get ready for the persecution. Now, regardless of how long you've been saved, we all need to be prepared for this, but especially if you haven't been saved for very long and especially if you haven't ever really experienced this before, be ready for it. And this is one of the reasons why Jesus is, is giving us this information in the Bible of telling you you're blessed. Because it doesn't feel good to have people mock you and ridicule you and persecute you and make fun of you. No one likes that. Okay, it doesn't matter how thick skin you have. No one likes it. It's not enjoyable. It's not pleasurable. But don't let that get you out of service to God because people are being that way to you. Don't buckle and fold. Just remember that you're blessed. And the more that people will attack you and try to silence you and get you to shut up because you're actually preaching the truth, you're actually standing for the word of God, the more that happens, the more blessed you are. We have the example which Jesus references here. You know, which one of the prophets were not persecuted? All the men of God suffered persecution, suffered afflictions. All of them. When you make a stand for the Lord, why? Because the things of God are not the things of the world. They're two completely opposite things. If you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. That's what the Bible says. You can't have it both ways. You're on one side or the other. You, and, you, and you try to straddle the fence and, and try to have it as much as you can, you're going to get the worst of both. <laughs> just, just make the stand for God. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. He's telling you you're blessed because you're not going to feel very blessed. Blessed are ye when you're poor in spirit. I don't feel that good. Yeah, but you're blessed. Have the right mindset to understand the blessing is there to the point to where, like the disciples did, they finally got it. When they got beat and thrown in prison, they rejoiced for it. 
They actually leapt for joy. Great. And I don't think that was an act. I think they actually, met, I think they actually got it and they understood, no, this is, this is actually, you know, what an honor to be able to suffer for Christ. And it is. It's a different way of thinking, though. And especially when you're newly saved, you're not used to thinking like that at all. Because it's totally not intuitive with what you've learned from the world. But it's completely in tune with what the Bible teaches. In the world, you shall suffer persecution. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. That's what Jesus said. He gives us the warning. You'll be reviled, you'll be persecuted. People will say all manner of evil against you falsely. People will lie about you. Just make things up. You say, I didn't even do that. I don't even know where they're coming up with this. It's because you believe in the Bible, because you believe in Jesus. They'll start making stuff up. No reason to get upset. No reason to have to write it and, and write all the wrongs and make sure everyone... You know, just be, be glad. Rejoice. Jesus said, I said be glad. Jesus said be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. Now we don't know what all the rewards are exactly going to look like. You know, at the judgment seat of Christ. We don't know that. There's not quite enough information given. But think about a God that loves you enough to sacrifice his only begotten son to offer you a gift where every single one of your sins, your transgressions, it's all completely paid for, that requires nothing of you, but just to believe him, just to trust him. The same God that offers that to you now is saying, hey, when you go through these hard times, don't worry, because I got something in store for you, a reward. I mean, we could only imagine how great that'll be. I mean, it's not going to be just some, it's not going to be like one of my prizes for the Bible memory passage, all right? <laughs> I've had someone not really want to get any rewards that we give out for the Bible memory because they're thinking that like, I think it's because they're thinking, you know, well, I don't want to like, I don't want to sacrifice, and I understand the concept, believe me, I don't want to sacrifice any of my eternal rewards for doing something for God, right? So I don't want to take your, your rewards here. But God's rewards are going to be so, so much better than the Dunkin' Donuts gift card, <laughs> right? <laughs> that I think God's going to be laughing at that. <laughs> yeah, you don't worry. That's not going to infringe on your, on your benefits, right, on your rewards that you're going to get. But seriously, it, it's, it's um, you know, he, he tells us these things. He's saying, hey, you may go through an entire lifetime here of, of, you know, some suffering or some pain points of being poor, being meek, being lowly, being, you know, the off-scouring of the earth, being the scum of the earth in the world's eyes. But don't, don't let that bother you. Because God's got your back. God's going to give you rewards. Just maintain the course. That's what God really wants you to do. Don't get out of the fight. Don't get out of, of doing what he wants you to do. It's all worth it in the end. Just have that faith. Don't lose that faith. Trust that because it, it's, it's as true as a day is long, as true as your salvation. God will reward you. He'll bless you. You could be exceeding glad when your people lie about you. Let's bow our eyes at word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for these blessings, these beatitude blessings in Matthew chapter 5 and helping us to, to get our heads on straight and understand that we don't have to let these things that might seem to be bad things bother us when we put them in the proper perspective and you shine the, the light, the truth on why these things are and, and what you're going to do and that you are there to be the ultimate revenger and the, and the ultimate rewarder. 
God, we live by faith. Help us to walk by faith. As much as we received our salvation by faith, God, help us to, to live that out on a daily basis and not to get um, just brought down to the point to where we want to give up. Lord, help us to be strengthened. Help us to strengthen one another, especially when persecutions or afflictions do arise. Lord, help us to be there for each other and to maintain that, that faith that it, it will all be worth it. And we just need to hang in there and, and trust that you will reward us one day. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.